it's not a comfort at all to say, wait a minute, here's my nest egg, here's my savings. And I now have to dip into that for my daily living costs. And that's very scary. What we are seeing is one of the on fire personal finance trends is living inheritance. If people are buying $7 packs of oranges without looking at the price, the increasing price won't affect demand. And so prices won't come down, they'll keep rising. From the Zoomerplex in historic Liberty Village, The Zoomer with Libby Snymer. Welcome to The Zoomer, I'm Libby Snymer. We Zoomers have been here before. We've survived the spiraling inflation of the 1970s, followed by double-digit interest rates in the early 80s. In both cases, food and energy price shocks were the trigger. Four decades later, the Bank of Canada is again wrestling with high inflation as the price of everything from fuel to food continues to skyrocket. So amid high inflation, what can we learn from past experiences and what are the best ways to protect your budget and track your spending? In just a moment, we'll break it down with a panel, but before we dive in, let's tee up the topic. Zoomers are no strangers to ever-increasing numbers, particularly inflation rates. In the 1970s, the average inflation rate hovered at 3%. But over the next 10-year period, prices began to increase on an average of 8% per annum. By 1980, inflation had skyrocketed to 10%. This meant a grocery basket, which once cost $100 in 1970, would more than double 10 years later. The central bank tried to rein it in by raising interest rates and in 1991 introduced an inflation target of 2%. Since then, inflation targeting has done its job until now. With inflation spiking over 8% for the first time in four decades. So, are we heading towards a recession or is this just another bump in the economic highway? And before we get to that question, we were all expecting the most recent rate hike to be big, but it was even bigger than anyone predicted, a full percentage point. So is a recession inevitable and is there a better way of driving inflation down? Gordon, you say that uh, the Bank of Canada is basically making up for mistakes they made last year. Yeah, they were very slow off the mark in this. The uh, situation was that um, the Bank of Canada was saying interest rate increases were transitory. And in fact, they weren't transitory, as we're now finding out. And so uh, now they're going back to the tried and true method of uh, raising interest rates to try to uh, squash uh, the inflation. I mean, remember, the, we started to get inflation before interest rates moved up. So there's no evidence that, in fact, uh, by uh, delaying the interest rate increases, we're not going to uh, spark more inflation. Uh, interest rates have to rise. There's no question. David, for Zoomers, for older people who you know often have to live on money they've accumulated, this is a big problem. I think a lot of people who are on the um, border say late 50s, early 60s, even to mid 60s, uh, are, will delay retirement or will come out of retirement because you need an influx of cash to cope with higher costs. There's just no way around it. If you're not in the labor force, if you're at an age of traditionally, okay, he's retired now, um, what do you do? There's your amount coming in, there's your CPP, your OAS, your, your private pension, your, for, uh, your RRSP, what do you, that's what it is. And now here come these costs up and up and up and here's the money fixed. Um, no recourse but to look for savings wherever you can find them and not a lot of room to maneuver. So it's very, very serious. Leslie Ann, you're here. That's that's your area. Not a lot of room to maneuver. What are you telling your clients and and people about what to do? That's right. So it's it's Zoomers who are affected. It's families that are affected. It's anybody with that was kind of living without a lot of flexibility in their budget to begin with. 
those are the folks that are dealing with this. So what I'm seeing with my students, with my clients, and generally in the media right now is most people have actually done some work to go and trim on their costs. They've been doing it now for a number of months. As inflation has increased, they've been targeting certain areas of their budget. And by the way, if they weren't budgeters beforehand, they all of a sudden kind of got forced to become budgeters during this environment. But what we're now seeing is that is just not enough. So we're counseling people and coaching them to take a good hard look at income options. Options. Income options could be a delayed retirement, so continuing to work. It could be having secondary or even uh, another two, three, four sources of income coming into the household. What it's looking like at the present moment with inflation higher than it's been in 39 years is people, they just have to work more. They have to make more. And yeah, of course, they're going to trim, but there's only so much trimming that you can do, and like I said, a lot of that's already been done. There, there is one little bit of, of uh, buffer or good news that we have coming into mid-2022, uh, and that's at the savings rate. Um, people haven't quite reached that same level of spending that they had uh, prior to the pandemic. Typically, Canadians save 2 to 3% of their income. Um, we peaked at 28% in 2020 because there was nothing to do. <laughs> Even today, I was say, not yeah, for lack nothing of trying. to do, right? <laughs> what good were shoes? No one looked at them when you were on a Zoom camera all day. And uh, it's still about 11%. So it's still four or five times higher. Now, that's only going to last so long, but it is a bit of a buffer that is, is different than previous uh, rate hike scenarios. It's a buffer, but it's a buffer for some people. You know, there are some people who did really well during COVID and right. saved a lot of money, and there are some people who are losing their businesses. Yeah, that's true. And for Zoomers, I would suggest, that, Bill, in that age group, the notion of having to dip into your savings for cost of living Scary. topics is in itself a new stress. It's not a comfort. It's maybe a comfort, okay, I, technically I can go to the store and buy the food as opposed to starving, but it's not, it's not a comfort at all to say, wait a minute, here's my nest egg, here's my savings, and I now have to dip into that savings, not for an investment or not even for a, you know, a rare vacation. big ticket vacation, you know, which I'm used to doing. Now I've got to do it for my daily living costs, and that's very scary. Yeah. Very, very scary. That's why having a plan is so critical for people in retirement is because now that you are having to dip into those accumulated savings, knowing what the responsible level is that works under all inflationary scenarios, whether it comes back down to 2%, not likely, whether it comes back down to 4 or 5% in the next couple of years, your plan has to work across all scenarios, and it's critical that everyone has one. I totally agree with Fraser on that. So what we're actually seeing in our community is one of our fastest growing um, student groups is ages 60 to 70, and they are rapidly putting together retirement readiness plans. Now, is that would it would have been great to have done that 10 years ago, 15 years ago? Absolutely. But I commend those who've had that moment of recognition that, hey, you know what, I need a plan. The, the current state isn't working for me. And I couldn't agree more. The emphasis on planning, understanding how much you can spend, understanding how, how deep can you go and, uh, into your savings. And also, if you are one of those people looking at being a, a late retiree, what does that mean for your overarching plan and your retirement portfolio? Okay, we will pick this up on the other side of the short break, and we'll be right back with more of the Zoomer. Baby boomers have always considered their homes as a crucial part of retirement savings, and the increases in prices have generally worked in their favor. Now prices have begun to drop, albeit from a very high point, and Zoomers are very engaged in helping their children become homeowners. According to a CIBC economics study last fall, close to 30% of first-time buyers received an average of $82,000 for down payments 
from their parents, in addition to other types of financial help. So what are the potential implications for retirement? Phil. Well, first of all, the stat is right. And by our research, about one in four parent is helping a first time home buyer in some way. We have to remember that we had in our two biggest real estate markets, which are British Columbia and Ontario, a uh, market correction in 2017, a housing market correction. So the market actually contracted in 18 uh, and the first half of 19, we were just coming out of it when 2020 came around. It was gonna be the best year since the, uh, the mid-teens when the pandemic hit. Of course, we thought, you know, oh my goodness, this will spend, spell the end of days for uh, real estate. And what happened instead, um, the home became the center of our lives and we saw uh, a run on both transactions and prices everywhere. So we were going to have a correction, which is when prices uh, adjust after uh, this run up anyway. And along comes this, uh, this, this horrible economic uh, syndrome uh, called inflation that we haven't had to deal with in the real estate industry or the economy in a long time. And uh, it hit pretty hard. In the first quarter of the year, uh, prices started to slide. But I believe the second quarter of 2020 uh, captured most of the price adjustment we're going to have in 2022. And uh, our outlook is we'll actually end 2022 5% above home prices the end of 2021. Lower than that peak in March of 2022, but higher than the end of last year. David, you know, on the one hand, Zoomers have always thought of their homes as part of their retirement savings, but we keep hearing more and more that more people want to age in place. They want to be at home. That means that their home isn't uh, an asset that they can kind of cash in anytime soon. Well, that's why you're seeing such a phenomenal increase in the reverse mortgage market, because they have captured value in that home. They can borrow, I think, 55% of the appraised value of the home. They can take it as a lump sum. They can take it as a small bump each month for their income if they wanted. It's cash. There's way too much money tied up in that um, form of an asset not to turn it into liquid cash. That market is red hot and I think is going to continue to be red hot. Gordon, what's your take on that? Well, the reverse mortgage market has been around for a long time, and it's only in the past uh, few years that it's actually started to get any traction. Uh, one of the um, factors uh, at work here is exactly what David just pointed out, is that it does open the uh, equity in your home uh, to actually having cash on hand to be able to finance uh, whatever it is that you need to do. And one of the things that people should be aware of if they're uh, going to take out a reverse mortgage is that they should be investing that money. If that money is invested in generating income, it becomes a tax, it becomes tax deductible. The income becomes tax deductible from that because it's invested in cash uh, from, a, uh, from a mortgage payment. So I think that that's something people should keep in mind if they're going to go that route. It's not my favorite route to go, but sometimes that's the only way you can do it. Leslie Ann, I want to get to this issue of the bank of mom and dad. And I've been seeing studies <laughs> of uh, people actually getting into financial trouble themselves or delaying retirement. And this, this predates inflation so that they can help their kids get into the housing market. And, and really, like, no matter how good a job you have coming right out of school or a few years in, you're not going to have a down payment of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Libby, I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> I'm so glad you did. So what we are seeing is one of the on fire personal finance trends is living inheritance for the purpose of home ownership. Now, I actually think that this trend is a beautiful trend. I would love to see more living inheritance happen in different kinds of ways, because what good is it to pass on inheritance after you pass away when your children actually need it today? That's my opinion. I know some people don't agree with it, but the problem that we're now seeing is 
the, the younger generation who has received this money, if they have not received uh, an equal amount of education on things like budgeting, how to uh, pay their mortgage on time and <laughs> keep up with their debt, they can end up in a situation where they're actually unable to afford the costs of total home ownership. And let me give you another example of what we're also seeing we're seeing a lot of co-signing where parents who are still working are co-signing on the mortgage saying, yep, yeah, we're gonna secure this mortgage whether or not our child can pay for it. And guess who ends up paying for it? <laughs> the parents. So this is somewhat of an issue, right? Because it is impacting retirement plans. My advice, and I actually recently wrote about this, um, my advice is only give what you can afford to lose. And if I were uh, in the giving position, <laughs> I would say no strings attached. It, you just need to be able to, with a clear conscience, give that money. And honestly, one of the best investments that I now see parents giving to their adult children is financial counseling and coaching and financial planning services. So if you are thinking of a Christmas present to go along with that down payment of oh, $82,000, I would definitely insert a financial plan and some counseling, counseling and coaching. It's interesting what you say about uh, living inheritance. There's, a, there's an old Russian proverb, give while the hand is still warm. David, what is your reaction to what well, you just Well, I think heard? what we've got to circle back on is when I gave, when the parent gave the child 82, whatever the number is, mm -hmm. did that top them up so they could afford the down payment on the house? and they're fine thereafter? Or did that enable them to buy a house at the absolute insane sky high top of the market? And I've heard a lot of anecdotes So thank God you got into the market even though you paid $800,000 for a 100 square foot car. I mean, <laughs> and now if the interest rates budge one iota, that child is absolutely out of luck and therefore they gotta come back to mom and dad for more. So what was the financial condition at the time? And I think we got to pay some attention to that because in some cases, the kids were fine and they just needed that top up because it was faster than trying to save it in after-tax dollars and the parents had it. And there's no reason not to, to I completely agree. But if, they're, if you're helping them into a property that they really have no business buying, and the moment interest rates goes up, and we haven't talked yet about what's going to happen to mortgage interest rates going forward, what happens when those kids are looking at 7 8%? Okay. We're taking a quick break, and we'll be right back. The flip side to high mortgage rates is that investments are likely to grow faster as they accumulate more interest. So what are some of the ways rising rates will impact Zoomers' portfolios, whether they're invested in stocks, bonds, annuities, or real estate? Let us begin with Fraser. Yeah, the, the rising rates are not helpful for most people's portfolios because <laughs> they're not invested in uh, interest-bearing uh, uh, securities. And so what you're seeing is uh, bond values are down uh, as yields are rising. If people had long duration bonds, those are down. We're in a unique situation where both equities and fixed income are down at the same time. So a lot of people are, are seeing their portfolios really suffering. All you can do is, is invest from here. And you know what a lot of people do, the mistake they make um, is they, they act emotionally and that leads to bad decisions. People tend to exit the market at the, at the valley floor. So the key is to stay invested, stay diversified, um, take risk off your portfolio where you can, take advantage of rising rates and, and the yield that's available. You can generate more interest income, as you stated, and I think now people can take advantage of that. But historically, portfolios have been depressed because of this. So is it a good idea to uh, keep a bunch of money in some kind of cash instrument? Is that what you're telling your clients? You know, I think it's something that if it's suitable for that person's risk tolerance, so let's say they don't have an appetite for risk, and we use a five-point scale for that, so one being low risk, five being high risk. So if you're hovering around one, it definitely could make sense for you to shift part of your portfolio to be a, uh, a safer, in safer investments, like 
high interest savings accounts, GICs, or very, very low risk investments. So what I'm seeing with Zoomer portfolios is I'm seeing shifting of the portfolio, the assets within the portfolio. Um, thankfully, uh, I'm not seeing a ton of selling and uh, knee jerk reactions, which is very good. I think that Zoomers have been through this before, they've seen it and they know that really, uh, like kind of what Fraser was saying, continuing to invest and, and waiting this out is with some shifts in the portfolio is probably how you're going to fend for yourself and your portfolio going forward. Gordon. Well, I think that uh, what we've heard so far is very well uh, positioned. Um, essentially, my rule of thumb here is uh, you kind of, you've been through this before and we're going to go through it again you keep your cool and you keep your strategy and uh, you wait for things to turn. Now that can be very painful. Uh, we've all been noticing that our portfolio values have been going down unless you're an absolute genius and have it somewhere that's gone up like everything in energy. But uh, for most part, things have been going down and they're likely to gradually trend down for a while yet. And what's unique about the situation we're in now is that they're going down both on the equity side and the fixed income side. That's that's quite strange and quite rare. Normally, the fixed income part of your investment is a, uh, a, a sort of a, a cushion and uh, allows you to uh, limit your equity losses and perhaps gain something on the bond side. That's what we saw, for example, in 2008. Not happening this time. So it's the case, I think, if you just have to ride this out and hopefully... Well, not just hopefully, things will turn around. It's just going to take some time. What if you have more money to invest? If you're saying, okay, I'm going to take a deep breath and leave everything. But what do you do if you have more money? Do you wait? Do you put it in cash? Do you, what do you do? Well, as far as I'm concerned, what you do is you uh, keep the money aside and available um, high interest savings account or something like that, which of course is not going to uh, get a return that matches inflation. But I don't believe the market has bottomed yet. And to be putting money into the stock market these days or the bond market, uh, I think perhaps you're a bit premature. So I think it's the case of if you have some money set aside, you bide your time, you identify those securities that you want to invest in when it appears the market, the market has hit the bottom, and I regard a bottom as being a point at which the market has then rebounded 20%. Uh, I look for a 20% rebound in the market to ensure that we've seen a change in momentum in the market. And that's the point to start making selective investments. What's that doing to the real estate market? Well, they are, for most Canadians, our, our homes are our largest financial asset. Uh, the good news is it's well protected. We talked about before the break, the, the risks uh, that people are facing as, as mortgage rates uh, rise. We have a very stable financial system. And the demand, uh, as I look out through the next decade, with uh, millennials reaching peak buying ages and boomers, finally having been unburdened from children who stayed at home longer than any previous generation, are also trading in real estate. So just organically, there's a lot of trading happening which keeps the market vibrant. You add to that 400,000 plus new Canadians a year and up to 850,000 foreign students. We're the third largest nation on earth as a host of foreign students. And you have a lot of demand in, in a country that is in last place among the OECD countries, the advanced economies, in terms of homes per capita. So we have the fewest homes, the fastest demand. So the bottom line is the housing investment that we're 70% of Canadians are sitting on is pretty stable. Now, that doesn't mean that prices are going to rise this year. It just means you're not going to see what America did when their financial system collapsed in 2009. Fraser, there are some people who say that this situation is making annuities of various kinds more attractive. Uh, you're with the Longevity Fund, so explain that. How do you see it? 
Yeah, the rising rates are, of course, increasing the value that someone can get from an annuity. So the annual income that's generated uh, has risen over the past little while. Annuities are a great product. They ensure against longevity risk. The idea that any one of us might live to be a very old age, and we need to ensure, as I said earlier, that we have a plan to generate income to cover all our needs. What annuities don't do in an inflationary environment is they typically don't increase. And so if you fast forward 30 years, if you're 65 and could live into your 90s, that annuity is generating a lot less cash flow at a time when you actually need perhaps more cash flow for your, for your healthcare needs later in life. And so our fund, the Longevity Pension Fund, is designed deliberately to increase rates over time in most cases. It's a variable rate and it's got an inflationary sleeve in the portfolio. So there's assets in there that are designed to increase over time. Real assets like energy, commodities, real estate, uh, base metals and precious metals. Okay, we'll be right back with more of the Zoomer. Welcome back. Rising prices can feel impossible to manage, especially if money is already tight. So beyond cutting streaming subscriptions or purchasing fewer or cheaper groceries, how should Zoomers think about trimming their budgets to survive inflation? Leslie Ann. So this is the most asked question I'm getting right now. How can I save in my budget? As I mentioned earlier in our program, if you weren't a budgeter before, my number one piece of advice here is you do need to start budgeting and paying attention to your costs. When it does come to those groceries and gas categories, groceries, it's about meal planning, it's about changing where you're shopping. I'm gonna tell you just today, I actually posted uh, and oh my, oh my heavens moment where someone was about to pay $7.99 for pre-cut oranges, just <laughs> two pre-cut oranges, and they put a label on it that said, for soccer moms. And, <sighs> you know, a bag of oranges, like a giant bag of oranges is $3.50. But these are choices. And so when it comes to budgeting, everything is a choice. The way that you are, you know, the way that you're planning your route, you're, you're bundling your errands, you're even bundling your services. Um, you know, now, obviously we've had some recent outages and services like uh, telecom services, <laughs> but generally bundling services uh, for insurance, your telecommunications can result in big savings, just managing costs. And really right now, if you are one of those people who are on a very fixed income, everything should be on the table. Take a look. And this is what will bring inflation back down is when we act as conscious consumers and we make changes to our buying behavior. If people are buying $7 packs of oranges without looking at the price, that won't, the increasing price won't affect demand. And so prices won't come down. They'll keep rising. I think everyone faces their own inflation basket. We don't all face the 8% that's nationwide. Um, I drive an electric car, and so I don't face the gas price increases, so that pulls down my total inflation. I travel a lot, so that increases my inflation. And if people think about rebalancing how they spend, they can still live a wonderful life in retirement, just looking at prices and adjusting their spending accordingly. I have seen a container of pomegranate arrows taken out of the pomegranate for 10 bucks. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> Crazy. Wild. And I'm sure I know people who bought it. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> totally. Pre prepared meals. Uh, well, yeah. yeah, that too. Um, we rely a lot on something like prepared meals. And I think a lot of older people, they don't feel like cooking, especially if they're on their own. I think that we, we have to realize is that the size of the population, the 65 plus population, more than 12 million something people. So you've got sub niches now that are each quite large. So when we sit here, and I'm trying to be you know, honest here, we're talking about the margins, about whether you can buy a bag of oranges or pre-cut oranges, but there's a lot of people that aren't close to being in that favorable of a position, that they don't have discretion over basics. They've already, basic themselves, if that's a verb, down to nothing before all this happened. There's, a, there's over a million seniors in Canada living in poverty on fixed incomes, totally reliant on the government uh, pension, who are in deep, deep trouble. 
And that's not the same as an urban uh, professional, upper middle class uh, person that needs to be a good budget. I'm not, I'm not poo pooing it or minimizing it. We're all facing this. But let's face it, there's people that are facing these problems at a much higher level of intensity and with much less discretionary uh, power to move and bob and weave through it. And I think that's the real uh, tragedy or the victims of this. You know what, I, moving a little bit back from the French, because I, I believe uh, the governments collected in the cost country uh, did a fine job relative to other governments around the world in helping people through the pandemic. And they need to focus on our most uh, vulnerable through this economic crisis as well. But if you back up just a little bit to people who uh, own their own homes and those uh, uh, baby boomers, that number is north of 75%. There are ways to generate income from owning a property. Um, if you have a recreational property, a cabin or a cottage, uh, it's fairly easy now to generate revenue through Airbnb style short term rentals. And even to address our housing shortage across the country, municipal governments, including ours here in Toronto, are looking for ways to allow people to uh, subdivide or create housing within a home. So there will be more legal basement suites, more uh, more garages turned into garden to suites. living garden suites, and those are potentially a new source of income that could help uh, so people who just never thought of that before. That's true. And there's more after the break. Don't go away. Welcome back. As always, we like to get to some of your questions and comments. The first coming from Anna. Hi, my name is Anna and I'm from Toronto. And I'm wondering if there's gonna be a housing crash like there was in the 80s because the mortgage rates are going up and who knows how high up they're gonna go. People are not gonna be able to afford to pay them anymore. Well, I guess that one's mine. <laughs> the, um, uh, the, the short answer is no. The, and it, it relates back to the uh, safety of our housing stock, our financial system, um, those who write the mortgages, uh, even our regulatory system. It's, it's uh, been refined constantly uh, over previous crises, and, and I believe it's uh, the safest in the world. Um, when people buy a home today, they, they have to pass the, uh, a stress test that shows that they can handle uh, a mortgage much higher than they actually pay. So it's, uh, it's a, a stable industry. I don't think we'll see price gains for anybody this year. Uh, but maybe as early as the spring of 2023, at the first, I believe at the first hint of some positive message from policymakers that uh, they believe that tightening monetary policy, in other words, higher rates, are having some impact, we'll see the same thing we saw in the spring of 2020 that we saw in 2009. We'll see first-time buyers rushing into the market uh, because they don't want to miss out it'll start a virtuous cycle of, of buying and selling again, and we'll be back in action. Yes, I agree. I think those comments are uh, certainly online. The only thing I would point out, however, is what we don't know, this whole X factor in the equation, is just how high mortgage rates are going to go. Uh, hopefully, we're not going to see anything in the, the order that we saw in the 1980s when um, mortgage rates went to over 20%. And that was what our question was referring to, uh, because that was a situation, obviously, in which some people uh, actually walked away from their homes, especially in Alberta. Hopefully, we're not going to see anything like that. We'll have this um, more or less stable market, uh, and um, the demand will be there, and we won't have a significant deterioration in housing prices. But I just have to say, it has happened before. In, in uh, September of 1981, the then CEO of uh, Rolla Page stood up in front of the uh, gathered folks at the national conference and said, if we can just get mar uh, interest rates or mortgage rates down to 17 or 18 percent, we can get this market going again. And they peaked that September at 21.4 percent. So we have in our history, as Gordon points out, 
lived in very, very different times. Yeah. Well, I, I remember getting our first mortgage after we got married, and we were thrilled. It was down to 12.7%. Yep, yep. <laughs> our next question comes from Stephen. Hi, my name's Steve, and I'm from Toronto. And my question is, I've been aggressively paying down my debt. Um, in times of inflation, is it better to keep doing that or should I start saving aggressively? Leslie Ann. So I am uh, out on a limb here, but Stephen looks kind of like a late millennial. So <laughs> I think what I would recommend is like, there's always benefit to paying down debt, especially if it's consumer debt. So we want to keep focused on making sure consumer debt is decreasing but the most millionaires are made during periods of market volatility. So my best advice is consistently contributing and investing to good quality investments as the market is coming down on the bottom and as we recover. Consistency with contributions and investing is really the secret sauce to making money with investing. That means you're gonna be buying at different prices. We don't know where the bottom is, but the good news is that you won't have to guess. You're just gonna be consistent with your approach. So I think there's a bit of a balance there, paying down some debt and consistently contributing. Yeah, I would uh, look at the interest rate levels and the structure of that. If the debt is on a variable rate and we're watching those rise uh, and he picked up those loans at a lower interest rate, it could be that they're really stressing his finances. So I would think that he'd want to pay down a lot of that initially. It's very hard to time the bottom of a market. And so I like Leslie Ann's approach of, of investing consistently. But at the same time, if that's, uh, if that's rising interest rate debt, he could be getting himself into trouble. Now we have an email question from Derek, who writes, the elephant in the room is that boomers have caused this problem. David, is that fair? Well, here we go. <laughs> yeah, poor boomers. Oh, poor boomers. <laughs> Um, the problem with all of this is that it, it makes it sound like all the boomers got together in a hotel room one afternoon and figured out how to ruin the planet. <laughs> and, uh, of course, it's nonsense because... And make is, a load of money on housing. Uh, absolutely. And so there, it, it, it implies a deliberateness and a uh, uniformity to a generations and the, the conventional benchmark of boomers is 1946 to 1965, 1966, give or take a year. Worldwide, 20 years, hundreds of millions of people all got together one afternoon and said, let's see if we can ruin everything. And so it's a... It's a for our it's children. A, for our children, yeah. <laughs> As we write the checks to pay for the sins that we've committed. So it's a, it's a, I don't uh, have any time for that uh, question, frankly. I always say there comes a point when you've got to stop blaming mom and dad. <laughs> yes! <laughs> I, I would also, I, I think in some cases, boomers are doing very well, but as David said earlier, they're not all doing well. There's people out there who really can't take blame for this and they're struggling and that's, that's critical to remember. I do think that there's a sense among younger people today that the future is not as rosy for them over the next 30 years as the past 30 years has been. And that's, that's uh, reflective of some deep economic anxiety that can't be ignored. So I think that's the genesis of it, but I agree with the other panelists that it's, it's not uh, fair to, to castigate boomers. When we come back, final thoughts from our panelists. That's next. <laughs> Welcome back to The Zoomer. It's now time for final thoughts from our panelists, starting to my left with Gordon. Uh, I think the main thought I would just leave you with is one that I stated earlier in the show, and that is, this too shall pass. Uh, we are not going to be in this situation forever, but it's going to uh, be a while before we get out of it. And uh, essentially, I advise you to uh, keep your cool, keep your strategy, and just hang in there. Bill. The pandemic put a hyper focus on our living accommodation, resulted in many too many people trying to buy homes at the same time, which uh, put this huge upward pressure on prices. Prices overshot, they needed to adjust, that's happening now. Uh, it will pass. 
and uh, home prices will be rising again. So if it's important to, to the listeners that the value of their home uh, increases for their plans, then that's exactly what's going to happen probably as early as 2023. We've had some great predictions here today for what might happen in different areas of the economy, but there's a lot of things that can that can occur that we just don't know. And so there's uncertainty in all, in house prices, in market activity, in inflation. Everyone's got to have a plan that lets them have income as long as they're alive through their retirement, as long as that is. And with that plan, they can then focus on what really matters, which is enjoying their retirement, making those meaningful years. And you know, as Gordon said, remembering this will pass and, uh, and seize the moment. I think what's different this time is who's this happening to from the Zoomer perspective, and we didn't talk about, but I'd just like to throw in the issue of longevity. The classic retirement planning strategy was you retired at 65, you're going to be dead in 12 years. You didn't have time to recover from a market <laughs> going down, so your investments had to be ultra conservative. And I'm echoing a bit what Gordon said about hang in there. This generation of people hitting in their 60s, let's say, or even older, have 20 or 30 years to go. So you will have time. You can be a little bit more, uh, I won't say risk prone, but a little bit more uh, open minded about different techniques and different strategies to keep income coming in because time is on your side in a way it wasn't for any previous generation. Leslie Ann? I think my best advice for anyone watching, listening is don't do this alone. So if you are one of those individuals or a couple or family that does not have a plan, you've never invested in your own financial education, go out, get some advice. There is no harm that can come from surrounding yourself with a, a fantastic financial dream team who's there to help support you. So, you know, focus on that. We will get through this. These corrections, they do happen. Looks a little different this time, but they do happen. We will come out the other side and we'll be fine. Thank you to our panelists and thank you, the audience, for being with us. After years of rock bottom rates and inflation, the new financial landscape is a shock even if we've experienced this when we were young. We hope the information you heard here will help you get through the new reality in our economy. We'll see you soon. It's time to Zoom out.